Welcome to this EEOC presentation with Lily Ledbetter, her story on the ongoing fight for equal pay. Be advised, captioning is provided for this presentation. You may enable captions on your device by clicking the closed caption or CC button in the Zoom webinar to begin viewing closed caption. Now may I present Terry Peters. Pardon me, Terry, if you could begin again. Greetings and happy Equal Pay Day. My name is Terry Peters and I represent the training programs for the Birmingham District of the EEOC. Did you know that Lily, who graciously insisted that we call her Lily, by the way, began her journey for equal pay in this very office? And we are very proud of that. Brace yourselves as Lily Ledbetter shares her phenomenal story with an accent that would make any Southerner proud. Her story is not only powerful and courageous, it is also inspiring. A few things before we get started. SHRM, HRCI, and CLE credits will not be available for this event. We are, however, happy to announce that this event is being live streamed on YouTube and will be available for future viewing and for sharing. We have a lot of time for Q&A, so please place your questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Finally, not only are we grateful for our presenters' participation today, and to those in headquarters who assisted, I would also like to make a special mention of my colleagues that collaborated with me on this event and who are working behind the scenes today. Deb Finney from the Memphis District, Tanya Lennox from the Philadelphia District, and Marcel Baldwin, also from the Philadelphia District. And to you, always remember that you should receive equal pay for equal work. Enjoy the program. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Terry. Greetings, everyone. My name is Bradley Anderson, and I'm the EEOC Birmingham District Director. Thank you for attending this important webinar on equal pay. Today, we'll hear from Lily Ledbetter as she shares her personal story and her fight against pay discrimination. This year, March 15th, symbolized how far into the year women must work to earn what men earned the previous year. According to data from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics in 2020, women's annual earnings were 83 cents to the dollar as compared to men and the gap was even wider for many women of color. And although this is progress from the early 1970s when women only made 57 cents per dollar compared to men, progress has stalled over the past several years and much, much more progress is needed. Consider this, according to a recent report by Morningstar, a company that provides investment research and management services, in the first year of the pandemic, Female executives in the C-suite earned only 75% of what their male counterparts took home. That's the widest the gap has been in nine years. In addition to these staggering statistics, the pandemic has set the women's labor force participation rate back more than 30 years. The pandemic stalled gains women had made towards closing the pay gap and layoffs of, and lack of childcare have forced many women out of the workforce entirely. To address this, the EEOC recently issued new technical assistance on employment discrimination against caregivers in the context of the pandemic. In announcing the technical assistance, EEOC Chair Charlotte Burroughs stated, quote, by ensuring that caregivers know their rights and employers understand their responsibilities, the EEOC will help ensure that America's recovery from the pandemic is an equitable one, end quote. At the EEOC, our leader, Chair Charlotte Burroughs, has set priorities to address the pay gap, systemic discrimination, and harassment. EEOC is also conducting many workshops and other outreach events to listen to employee concerns, educate workers on their rights, and teach employers about their responsibilities under the law. In today's workshop, you'll hear introductory comments from EEOC's Chair Charlotte Burroughs. She will be followed by EEOC Vice Chair Jocelyn Samuels, 
will speak about EEOC's ongoing work to address pay equity and will introduce Lily Ledbetter, our guest speaker. Then Lily will share her personal story about the pay discrimination she endured and what she did to address it. Chair Burroughs has dedicated her professional career to advocate for strong civil rights protections. At EEOC, she is leading robust cooperation between the agency, employers, employees, and stakeholders to advance equal opportunity in the workplace. Prior to her appointment at the EEOC, Chair Burroughs worked at the Department of Justice and on Capitol Hill, where she worked on the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act of 2009 and other civil rights initiatives. Vice Chair Samuels has for much of her career worked to increase pay equity in the workplace. She also worked closely with Lilly as they advocated for changes to the pay equity laws that became the Lilly Ledbetter Act. So without further ado, it is my honor and my privilege to introduce the chair of the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, Charlotte Burroughs. Thank you and good afternoon. And thank you so much for that warm welcome and introduction. My thanks to Terry Peters and all of the EEOC colleagues from the Birmingham, Memphis and Philadelphia districts for organizing today's program and inviting me to participate. I am so delighted to be here with our esteemed guest, Lily Lidbetter, my friend and colleague, Vice Chair Samuels, and all of you to discuss the critically important work of equal pay. It's truly a privilege to join you to reflect on Lily's trailblazing journey and celebrate her tireless persistence and courage. Much has been spoken and much has been written about her 10 plus years fight for equal pay. And we'll hear more today about this soon from Lily in her own words. What I'd like to highlight in this moment are the enormous personal sacrifices that L Lily made to so many women, uh, for so many women in the workplace and so many other workers as well. With great courage and fortitude, she put herself out there in the pursuit of justice and endured workplace retaliation because of it. Yet despite the countless hours she devoted to working against pay discrimination, she herself never received a penny of compensation for that work or frankly from the bill that bears her name. But what Lily achieved cannot be measured in dollars and cents. And that's the great example she set to all of us by showing that ordinary citizens can have extraordinary impact, that every one of us can help correct injustice, even if that injustice has lasted years, decades, or longer. And Lily is a living testament to the power of individuals to ensure that our civil rights laws live up to their purpose. As Dr. King said in Alabama so many years ago, at the start of the Montgomery bus boycotts, Democracy transformed from thin paper to thick action is the greatest form of government on earth. And through her action and advocacy for equal pay, Lily put this issue on front pages across America and on the front burner for Congress. I can say without a doubt that it was Lily's own persuasive power that moved Congress to enact the bill that bears her name. When she called when she was called to testify, twice she came. She personally spent hours, countless hours, speaking to senators and members of the House of Representatives with those of us who staffed the bill and with the press. And it was exhausting work. It was selfless and it was inspiring to me and to so many, many, others across this nation. So I'd like to thank Lily and her family for all that they sacrificed to help achieve fair pay in the workplace, due in no small part to the leadership of Lily and so many champions for pay equity. Our nation has seen progress in narrowing the pay gap based on gender and race and in other areas as well. But there's more work to be done. It's been almost 60 years since President John F. Kennedy signed the Equal Pay Act of 1963. 
requiring that men and women in the same workplace receive equal pay for equal work. And since Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 64 outlawed pay discrimination and promotional discrimination based on race, sex, including sexual orientation, pregnancy, and gender identity, also color, national origin, and religion. Yet significant and unjustified pay disparities still persist. Last week, we recognized Equal Pay Day, which symbolizes just how far into the year women must work to earn what men earned the year before. And as Birmingham District Director Brad Anderson noted earlier, women who work full-time in the United States make up just about 83%, 83 cents for every dollar paid to men. That pay gap is even wider for women of color, for mothers of young children and women with disabilities. Black women make just 64 cents for every dollar paid to white non-Hispanic men. Latinas are paid just 57 cents on every dollar. And due to pay inequality, women stand to lose more than $400,000 over the course of a 40 year career. As Lily has said, those pennies add up to real money. And so the EEOC is working hard to address pay discrimination and other forms of discrimination that contribute to unjustified, gap, unjustified gaps in pay. We've recovered millions of dollars for workers paid unequal wages in the administrative process and in litigation, as well as achieving real changes to workplace policies to prevent future violations. Our agency will continue to use all of our tools to promote pay equity and to close gender and racial pay gaps. And we recognize that the lack of access to pay data has been a long-standing gap in the enforcement toolbox here at the EEOC. And it limits our ability to enforce legal protections for pay equity. Because salaries are not public, workers often have no idea when they are shortchanged. And so they can't report it to the EEOC. Simply put, pay discrimination is hard to fight because it's hard to find. In Lily's case, she only learned that she was being underpaid because she was a woman when she received an anonymous note in the workplace. So pay equity is just too important to be left to that kind of chance. We should not have to depend on anonymous notes to ensure basic fairness in the workplace. So we're looking hard at the EEOC in addition to our current enforcement and litigation, as well as outreach. We're looking at EEOC's data and ways to improve it so that we can learn more about pay disparities and potential gaps that, that will allow our agency to better and more effectively focus resources in this area. So while unequal pay is a persistent problem, there's really a growing consensus that the time has come to solve it. And I want to be clear that although there is more to be done, we at the EEOC are committed to doing that. And together, I am certain that we can finish the job and live up to our nation's most deeply held values of equality, fairness and justice. And I want to say, Lily, again, thank you for your incredible and inspirational contribution to the fight for equal pay. At the EEOC, we, will sh we share your commitment and we will be continuing that fight. And I'll now turn over the program to Vice Chair Jocelyn Samuels. Well, thank you so much, Chair Burroughs, and thank you, Terry and all of your colleagues for the tremendous work putting together this exciting event and for everything that you, my colleagues do to advance the cause of equal pay and non-discrimination in the workplace. We are so grateful for your work. I'd also like to welcome and thank all of you who are joining us from around the country and even overseas. And I have to say, it is a huge thrill to be able to be on the same program with my friend and force of nature, Lily Ledbetter. It's not often that I get to share a platform with a civil rights hero like Lily. And the huge number of you who are joining us today demonstrate the power of her story and her fight for equal justice. As you heard from Brad, 
The fight for equal pay is ever more urgent today given the catastrophic effects of the pandemic on so many women and caregivers and the fact that as you heard from Chair Burroughs, pay disparities continue to be pervasive in the workplace. Pay discrimination, of course, is not just a problem for women. Eliminating sex, race, and ethnicity pay gaps would reduce the number of working poor, improve the financial security of many families, and strengthen our overall economy. Now, we know pay disparities are the result of many factors. Some of the gap undoubtedly reflects choices that individuals make about the jobs they take, and whether they work full or part-time. But as we know, these choices themselves are often affected by the realities of society's expectations for women. And in fact, it's undeniable that pay discrimination 60 years after passage of the Equal Pay Act is real and still all too pervasive. It can come about because women and men are paid unequally, even though they perform the same job. It can also be the result of initial assignments to segregated, historically female jobs, or the use of factors in hiring, such as salary history or unequal opportunities to bargain that can perpetuate the disparities. As Chair Burrow said, we at the EEOC are committed to using all of the tools at our disposal to address these issues. These include, of course, educating the public and employers about their rights and responsibilities, investigating and working to resolve equal pay charges, and when necessary, litigating to hold discriminating employers accountable. Just as with Lily Ledbetter's case, apologies, each of the cases that we bring at the EEOC takes an individual who brings their story to us, someone who believes they have been subjected to discrimination and who wants to stand up for their rights under the law. As the chair noted, our pay enforcement efforts have been robust and impactful. Our equal pay cases involve both men and women and I thought I'd share just a couple of examples with you. So for example, a female bank manager in Mississippi was paid less than men who occupied the same position. EEOC was able to secure over $100,000 in a settlement of her case. Five female librarians at a public library in Baltimore were paid lower wages than their fellow male coworker despite the fact that they had more years of service and experience. Following a five-day trial, the court ruled in favor of the EEOC, finding that the library had failed to produce any evidence to explain the male's higher salary. The court awarded the women back pay and liquidated damages and required the library to adjust individuals' retirement accounts consistent with the back pay awards. Similarly, a group of Black, female, and African-American employees at a life insurance company in Colorado were paid less than their male counterparts, harassed and retaliated against when they complained. The case was resolved through a four-year consent decree that provided $20.5 million to 21 individuals, and that also required the company to fix its pay and promotion policies going forward. We've also brought suits on behalf of men who are also protected by the employment discrimination laws and cannot be denied equal pay on the basis of their sex. Now, these are impressive results to be sure, but we also hope to ensure compliance at the front end rather than seeking remedies at the back end after discrimination has already occurred. Thus, for example, we coordinate closely with our sister agency, the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs at the Department of Labor, which oversees federal contractors on issues of pay equity. The HIRE initiative 
that was launched by Chair Burroughs and Director Yang last month has pay equity at its core. It aims to help connect underserved workers with good jobs and equal pay is a critical component of ensuring that women and workers of color and other underrepresented jobs groups can access good jobs and it expand an employer's ability to hire and retain a skilled and diverse workforce. And like with this event today, we work to educate employers and employees and provide you with the information and tools needed to understand and comply with the law. Go to our website, eeoc.gov, and search for the phrase equal pay, and you will find a wealth of materials that can help you understand your equal pay rights and responsibilities. In addition to using the tools that we already have, we also need to make sure the law, law is strong enough both to shield people from pay discrimination in the first place and to adequately protect those who are subject to it. As you'll hear from Lily Ledbetter, and as you heard from Chair Burroughs, one of the biggest obstacles to narrowing the pay gap is that pay discrimination tends to be invisible. Most people don't know what their colleagues are paid and Lily's case is a quintessential example of the problems that causes. And we see the results in the charges we receive. Over the last five years, only about 5% of all of the charges filed with the EEOC allege wage claims under Title VII, and only about 1.5% allege EPA claims. Employees are often unaware that pay discrimination is occurring. That's why I think greater pay transparency, among other things, is a key part of the solution. Passage of the Equal Pay Act and the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act in 2009 were crucial to advancing pay equity. But to truly close the gap, we need to do more. The administration recognizes that fact. On Equal Pay Day, just last week, President Biden announced various new initiatives to enhance equal pay protections. Among other things, he announced that the Office of Personnel Management anticipates issuing a proposed regulation to bar federal employers from asking applicants about their prior salary history, since that history can simply incorporate past arbitrary and potentially discriminatory pay decisions. Our partners at OFCCP issued a directive clarifying the scope of contractors' obligations to conduct annual audits of their compensation practices. And many employers are stepping up. An increasing number of businesses have made public commitments to wage transparency and state and local governments are also engaging in similar efforts. In addition, employers who monitor their pay data will have a tool for self-evaluation and course correction where it is necessary. Further, the Biden administration continues to call on Congress to pass the Paycheck Fairness Act, which would further help to mitigate, mitigate sex-based pay discrimination while ensuring greater transparency and reporting of disparities in wages. The Paycheck Fairness Act would update the standards of the Equal Pay Act to reflect the 21st century workplace. And we at the EEOC stand ready to help enforce it if it passes. So there's much more to be done. In the words of Dr. King, the arc of the moral universe is long. But that arc does, as Dr. King recognized, bend toward justice. And that's where our special guest, Lily Ledbetter, comes in. Lily has done virtually more than virtually everyone else in the country to seek justice against pay discrimination. And I know that you will find her story ins ins <laughs> inspirational. 
I first met Lily in the summer of 2007. As you will hear, she had just been told by the Supreme Court that she had waited too long to bring a pay discrimination lawsuit and thus would be barred forever from challenging the unequal pay she continued to receive. Even though she didn't know that she was being paid less than her male colleagues, and even though a jury had found in her favor and awarded her more than $300,000 in damages for the discrimination she endured. Well, Lily did not take that unjust decision sitting down. She was a tireless, tenacious, inspirational advocate for pay equity, whose authenticity, integrity, articulateness, and steel made her an indomitable force, urging passage of the law that rightly bears her name. Women across the country, not to mention the men in their lives, owe Lily a tremendous debt of gratitude for her enormous contributions to advancing the law's promise of equal pay. And I personally owe Lily a tremendous debt for being my mentor and my friend. I was incredibly privileged to be able to work with Lily on the legislative campaign to reverse the Supreme Court's decision and restore women's rights to challenge pay discrimination. Lily's grace and grit changed my life in so many ways. And I am confident that her story will move and inspire you. So it is with deep respect and tremendous pleasure that I turn the mic over to our special guest, Lily Ledbetter. Thank you, Joshua. <clears throat> thank you, thank you, thank you. That's one of the dearest friends I've ever had right there in Jocelyn Samuels. I uh, apologize for my throat being a little raspy today, but we've got the pollen going in Alabama and hay fever going, so it's a little bit raspy. But Jocelyn Samuels wrote me some wonderful speeches and covered the law and was there with me when we walked through the White House, uh, excuse me, the Congress with the House and the Senate. But today, all of you folks online with us, I can't tell you how I feel about the Equal Employment Opportunity Center because you folks mean so much because you saved my job in the early 80s. And as I told someone earlier, I think I did it with a phone call. And the fellow said, lady, we don't do it this way. And I said, well, Employment Opportunity Center in Birmingham at the time. He represented my side of it extremely well because he found that my employer, Goodyear Tire and Rubber, had some untruths in what they were saying. They were not correct. So I got the right to sue and the company said, what do you want? I said, I want my job back. So I did get my job back. I got exactly where I had been moved from. And I got moved away from the man who had told me that if you do not go to bed with me, you won't have a job. But I want to get back to why I'm so excited to be with you folks today, because your work, your work means so much to people like me, because I never had money really to hire an attorney that could stay with me uh, for a long period of time. Uh, I was fortunate after the Equal Employment called me and said I had the right to sue and I might want to find an attorney and get to federal trial faster. Um, I found a young attorney in Birmingham, Alabama with a large firm, Mr. John Goldfarb, who represented me and his firm. And today, I never got a penny of that original award, $3.8 million, and they never got paid either because they taught my case on a contingent basis. But my case is um, not unique. It belongs to so many American people and actually people around the world. But I had no idea that I was being shortchanged as much as I was. 
Now, did I think I was paid less than my counterparts? Yes, because I looked around and at the time I went to work for Goodyear Tire and Rubber in 1979, there, were no, there was no other women in the job I had. Uh, later on, they got one or two, but they never lost. They usually quit or, or left, whatever reason. But it was a good job and I really liked it. And prior to my going to Goodyear, I had worked for Jacksonville State University as Assistant Financial Aid Director. I had, was the district manager for H&R Block, managing 16 locations at the time. But Goodyear built the radio plant and that's why I wanted a job because next month I'll be 84. I was born in 1938. I was born in a time in my life that I knew that time would determine that women and minorities would be making progress and we would get more benefits. We get what was rightfully ours, what we were earning, not a gift, but what we were right, rightfully entitled to. I don't know if anyone told you folks, but I do have a terrible Southern drawl. People make fun of it, so that's okay. You can lie. It's, it's perfectly all right. I got uh, accustomed to the reference to it, and it's okay. But prior to going over to Goodyear, I had worked six years, two jobs, seven nights and seven days. I worked for H&R Block during those years and some other company at the time. So I had a lot of background. I knew what I was getting into to go to Goodyear in the manufacturing. But it was a good job. They paid well. They paid first line managers overtime. And that meant a lot to me because I had two children going into college, still had a mortgage on the house, had car payments, had dental bills, doctor bills, just like every other American family across this nation. But I went to work there in 1979 and excelled on the training program. So I was supposed to get a permanent position within nine months, but I actually got it in six months. They signed me to the stock prep area of the radial division where they made sidewalls, chafers, beads, all sorts of parts that went into tires. I did well, it was a good job. I worked night shift because it took 25 years to rate dates. I never really got day shift at Goodyear and Gadsden, but I went to work 19 years later, 19 years later, and realized that I had a piece of extra paper in my box at work. It had my name and three men. Those three men was making somewhere at the time base salary, $6,000 per month. Mine was 37. That's a lot of difference when you start dividing it out, time and half, double and triple. And like, for example, my peer had a heart attack. I worked my shift and his too, which was seven nights a week for two months straight. I was a lot of overtime that I missed. But I got that note that night and I looked around to see who might have left it because I was just devastated. I was embarrassed to tell you the truth. How many people in this factory know this? Their life and behind my back that Goodyear has seen fit to pay me less simply because I am a woman. And there was nothing that I didn't do. If it, my job required running around on top of the building, trying to get lamp black started or out on the building to get another piece of machinery running, I did it. Nothing backed me down. And the, it was not a problem. I got good reviews, one of the few I got, but they had three evaluations in my 20 years is all I had. But after I saw that note that night, and I tried to get up the energy to get out on the floor and face people and be able to talk to people and do my job for 12 hours, I really wanted to take my bag and go home. I really wanted to just hide because I was so devastated from learning how much less I was making. Someone said later, well, I really seemed smart they just didn't understand how I got caught in a situation like that. Well, Goodyear said they were that they was an equal employer company. They also said 
that they would uh, make sure that everybody was treated fairly and equitably. Also, when I went to work for Goodyear and Gadsden, they were making airplane tires for their air government planes. They were making Jeep tires for the Army and the Navy, Marines and all of them overseas. When I left, they had a contract for Hummer tires. So I felt sure. I just knew that the government was auditing their records and checking and making sure that they were adhering and following federal guidelines. But they didn't. They could get as many government contracts at the time that they wanted. All they had to do was just lobby enough to get those contracts to go forward. So that's one of the reasons I got really trapped. And the other one main reason was the fact when I filled out my paperwork to go to work for them in HR, they said, if you ever discuss your pay with a coworker, you will not work here. So no one ever discussed their pay. And of course, all men working around me they were definitely not going to confide in me or even they would try to find out what I made. But of course I didn't tell them because I didn't want to lose my job. But we, when I got that message and I found out, I thought about it all night. Halfway through my shift, it hit me. This is not only what I'm earning today and my family is able to have to live on, but this is my retirement, my contributory retirement, my 401k, and my social security. That's when I really got a knot in my stomach because at that time I was two years away from being able to retire. I just didn't know how I could let it go. I got home the next morning, I told my husband, I said what I had learned and I said, I must file a charge with the Equal Employment Opportunity Center Commission in Birmingham, Alabama, unless you object. And I will tell you now, if I start, we will be in this for at least eight months, uh, excuse me, eight years. I knew it would take a long time. I knew it was not a quick fix. And back then I took my shower, got dressed and he said, what time do you want to leave? And he drove me to Birmingham and I walked in that office without an appointment, without calling sat and waited my turn. I sat there for hours on end because it was packed with people. I got a interviewer named Ollie Crones. She'd been with the uh, office for a long time and she picked out at me all of the gory details. Uh, one of the things that I had brought up was the fact Goodyear had laid me off without pay for three days that I called some scrap but yet they didn't show it to me and they couldn't prove it to me. So I, that was one of the problems, but she got down to the nitty gritty and she pulled out of me all of the gory details. I think she was with me for at least three hours. It was a long time um, because I'm a manager for this big tire plant in Gadsden, Alabama. And I want to go and say, sound like a little whiner or a complainer or that bitch like a lot of people refer to people like myself. It was hard, but she got all the information. And I remember seeing the paper. She had written in every line, every margin. It was written up one side and on the others and all of them. And my attorney told her later that she had done a wonderful job because he had all the information that he needed to go to trial. But she was good. She really took the time and was dedicated to getting me to open up and talk. And when I got up to leave, she said, Mrs. Ledbetter, these people have been messing with you for a very long time. I said, I realized that today, but I never did before. Because the main thing, I think when a person is in that position that they know they're being harassed or mistreated, they're afraid. They're afraid to speak up. They're afraid of the, what will happen. And I've talked to so many people and I've asked, why didn't you file a charge with the Equal Employment Commission? Or why didn't you ask somebody? Why didn't you ask them, a friend? Well, I just was afraid. I just thought I'd just let it go and go on with my life. But that has cost so many people so much 
that they have earned and entitled to under the law. But we went to, I got Mr. Goldfarb, he accepted my case, and we finally got to trial. That was 1998, I filed the charge. 1999, I secured him. He, uh, not fall of 98, and he got, got us to trial in January of 2003. It was extremely cold and into the federal courthouse in my home county, and they were in Birmingham. They hauled in boxes and boxes and boxes of records. Um, and they proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that I had been discriminated against in my pay simply because I was a female. I had actually been born the wrong sex to get equal pay. The jury came back that Friday, five men and two women, and the foreman of the jury said, we find in the plaintiff's favor, 3.8 million. But the judge had to reduce it down to 300,000 because in my case, there was a cap. I was only entitled to 300,000 and he only gave me 30,000 per year on equal pay. He took the lowest paid male where I was working and calculated my back pay on that. No overtime, no lost benefits, no future benefits, just 60,000. So I left the courtroom with $360,000. And then we finally, when 11th Circuit disallowed it, and then we appealed and got heard in the Supreme Court in November of 2006. Waited till May of 07 to get the final verdict. But a life goes on. You have family celebrations, birthdays, weddings, and what have you. Um, but my husband, the worst thing, he got cancer. He had four. And the last one, two weeks prior to my going to the Supreme Court, he had had the left side of his face removed and skin grafted. And then he died in December of 08. He never lived to see the Ledbetter bill pass, but he knew it would because he supported me to go to Supreme Court to hear the case. He supported me to go every other time to Washington and walk the halls of Congress and testify twice in the House twice in the Senate, and I don't know how many miles Joshua Samuels and myself walked on that hill, NPR radio programs, and they would usually have me scheduled to do NPR radio or call-in shows early in the morning and late in the evening. So those would be long days. And how did I get to Washington with no money? A lot of the women's coalition and different groups paid for the plane tickets and put me in a hotel. And a lot of the gracious people in Washington bought my food. So it was, and back then gas was high too, because my husband had cancer treatments, radiation and chemo, and those were expensive to get to with the gas, the high, the price it was. And it was also hard that my income was so much less. But I got around to, they tried to push me out during the time the equal employment was investigating before they told me I had the right to sue and I got the attorney. They offered an early buyout. I took it and that was a mistake. I got 80% of my base pay, which was 28,000. The guy that did the same job, same job on day shift, he took it, he got 85,000. That's the difference in our pay. And that really makes a difference in my retirement. But they called in Washington and we started, go I started making those trips to walk the halls and testify and have hearings to try to get the bill supported and passed because it was necessary because that verdict in the Ledbetter case had closed the courthouse door, so to speak. It had closed it. It meant that if you would have had to file a charge almost immediately when you got a a job in the first six months. That's all you'd have is 180 days. And nobody is going to do that. They go, they're not gonna wreck their career doing that. But corporations, they can wear you out, they'll wait you out, they'll spend you out hoping you will give up. But Goodyear never offered a decent 
settlement that we could take. My attorney didn't wouldn't take it. And so we went all the way and we really should have won. We really should have had that at the Supreme Court. And for me, it was not so much money by then because the 360,000, the firm would have gotten 50% and I had already spent 40,000. I'd spent all of my IRAs then trying to get people to testify for me, carrying them, driving them to Birmingham. And two, back then I didn't have a cell phone. So all the long distance calls was on a phone. I had to pay for the calls. Times have really changed during this time of my, a uh, lot of things changed better than my income, that's for sure. But we got to trial and at trial, a lot of the people from Goodyear um, got on the stand and said, oh, I didn't get a top performance award. My boss said he gave it to me because he realized how much less my pay was compared to the males. And the judge jumped on that. Um, they tried to force me into saying that I wasn't as good as some of the men. I said, absolutely not. I said, in fact, I would rather have me working there than I had them. Um, so they brought that pretty soon and left me alone with that. But that when two women testified for me and they asked one of the women why she never complained. She said, I was a divorcee with a handicapped son, I live paycheck to paycheck. I could not bring up my pay because I knew I'd lose my job because that's what I had been told. The other lady said she gave up her job and went back to her secretary's job because they would not give her the raise that they, excuse me, that they had promised. But this has been a journey. I've traveled the world. The first place I got invited was to Rome, Italy. They had the same problem. Um, I've been to several places out of the country and been all over the United States. Um, they like the Southern drawl in a lot of places and that's okay. And I really was disturbed early on because all of the articles in the papers would always have my age. And I thought, why did they have to keep hanging up on the age? Then I got invited to Denver to speak at the Democratic Convention and they said, you will come not endorsing Obama. You'll just come like Ron Reagan had done. But the thing that I'm so proud of about the Ledbetter bill, it was sponsored and co-sponsored by Republicans and Democrats, both parties. And I love that. And it became a law by both parties because equal pay for equal work is not just a woman's problem. It's an American right. It's an American right, and it's like what the President Obama said when he signed the bill. It's a family right, too, because women work for their family, ever how many they are. And I talk to so many women across this nation, and men, too, that they're struggling to be able to support their family and to get all the family educated and on their own. But I ask why what you people do in the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the work you do cannot be measured by money because there's nowhere else to turn. If you are a female or an African-American or whatever the problem is, and you need to call someone just to ask advice or ask help, do you have a case? There's nobody to call except you folks. I knew that. I knew that back in the day. Um, and you meant so much just to have that number to be able to call. Never did I want a lawsuit. That's the last thing I wanted because I found out how much my neighbors thought of me. They thought I shouldn't have had that man's job. It wasn't a man's job, it was a job. I was qualified, I could do it. So there was not a problem really, but they felt like I shouldn't have had the job. But you folks, your work, I can't tell you. If you come to work and got a headache or feel bad, push through. Just think what you're doing for someone when they approach your office or you have to talk to them. Just know that that might make a difference. No telling how far down the road. There have been a lot of progress made since 2006 and 2007 when that verdict came out. In fact, when 
Congressman George Miller called me about naming the bill for me. He said when I first came to his courtroom to testify the first time, he was the chairman of the committee, the first thing out of my mouth, and I had a good speech. And uh, he said, when I heard that Southern drawl, I put my hand over the microphone and told the rest, the co-chair, boys, we're going to the White House. But that was, that was okay because that got some attention, but it was from the heart and it's from the heart that I get up every day, meaning to make a difference. I still do Zooms every day uh, that I can get one scheduled, I'll travel. I do whatever I can when people call, could you possibly a guess when you want me? And I go and as Jocelyn Samuel said, I have made a lot of sacrifices. I missed a lot of ball games and I was not home after a lot of cancer treatments for my husband, but he always said, go, go. And he, he really supported me because he knew what it had meant because he had driven me to work on many occasions at Goodyear when I'd be working those seven nights of 12 hours and he'd pick me up the next morning, which that wasn't an easy task, but he knew that it was hard. Uh, if we have any time, I'd like to uh, see if we have a question or two. There's a lot to my story. I didn't use a speech today and I have some really good ones from, I have them still from Josh and Samuels and I have them from uh, I've done a lot of graduation college to, uh, addresses and I got some good speeches. I didn't write them, but they're really good and um, I can deliver them. But today I wanted to talk to you from my heart to tell you what you folks mean to me um, because it, it is so important. Um, this world is full of people right today. And two, the other thing I've learned in doing all this work we women, we outlive our spouses on average by 10 years. I'm already in, this will be my 14th year. In December, my husband's been gone for 14 years. And when he died, the income here dropped 50%. And that's, that was hard, it's still hard. And uh, I, do, I do work on the side to make money to help keep expenses paid and to stay independent. Um, but that's a shame that women work hard. And I've heard so many stories that would just fill a book uh, about women and what they've been through and how they've sacrificed and their children. Um, it's very difficult. Lily, we do have a few questions if you'd like to take some. I would, I would because uh there's, there's things about my story, as you well know, you got the big hug out somewhere uh, because <laughs> though when she told me she worked for the Equal Employment, I grabbed her and hugged her because uh, I, owe, I feel I owe this organization a lot and I can't tell Brad how much I'm thrilled. I'm just thrilled beyond belief today to hear the, what all you folks are doing because it's just wonderful. A few years ago, the work got slack in Birmingham when they started doing uh, seminars around. And I know the city I live in kept an um, African-American lady working when they was about to fire. So the work you folks do, I just can't say I'm not far. It's, it's the best. If I ever find out they're cutting your, your operation, I'll be out there marching for you. Thank you. There was several, several comments thanking you for your fight and being an inspiration. Um, and we had a few questions. We had one person ask, how did you actually hear of EEOC? How did you know to call EEOC? That's a very good question. <laughs> My working for um, HR Block as a manager of 16 locations, uh, I had been to school and training and uh, my background was so dense into what I could do and what I couldn't, what I couldn't do uh, with my employees, even traveling from one location to the other and about equal employment. And uh, that was how I knew because I had been educated and that's a very good point. In fact, I tell college students, if I get to speak on a college campus, to be sure that they research and know the laws that pertain to them, like like equal pay, uh, Title Seven, uh, wage an hour. I said you're not going to be an attorney. You're not not might not even be an HR person. But you need to know because those decisions and laws 
pertain to you. And in fact, the, um, that is a good, good question because they should know. Okay. And they should stay current. If the if bills change, they should. Another individual wanted to know if you were retaliated against um, by your employer after you filed your complaint with the EOC. Absolutely. Uh, in the early 80s, that was pure hell to go through. So I knew what I'd be through in, um, in the 1998. I knew exactly they was doing their best to make me quit. I never would quit. So they finally came up with the uh, buyout, and I guess they thought maybe I would. And I thought, and I did. I was backed into a corner, and I thought maybe this is what I need to do, which was a mistake. Cost me a lot of money to take that buyout. But um, I didn't know it at the time, and I was backed into a corner. Um, but it's, um, it's just not... Um, easy to go through and and they did that they uh, they told me at first that i they'd send me home and i and i said uh is lothar going home the guy and they said oh no he's not going and said he's been here for 30 years he's a very good worker and i said if he's not going i'm not going so they put me in an office with a trainer and we just sat there and talked all day We'd go to lunch, go to break. And I did get day shift during that time because they watched me until we had the hearing. Okay. One individual wanted to know if anyone from Goodyear ever apologized to you. No. In fact, Washington tried to get them to increase my retirement based on the 60000 I didn't get, which wouldn't have been much. But they said, no, she was a poor performer. And that's what they tried to say all over. In fact, outside the White House, the day the bill was signed, they was telling reporters she was a poor performer. But the judge, even during trial, asked to speak, asked to see my personnel file, and they couldn't produce it. My boss said on the stand they had burned my file because I was gone. And uh, the judge said, let me explain the law to you folks. When someone files a charge, you retain that record until that case is completely closed. And they got caught in two of my, the one with the uh, um, extra award, that one was a discrepancy. And then there was another boss of mine that they flew in from, I believe he was out of Oklahoma. He had a, another lie. And I, I, I have heard from all of the African-Americans and women all over the world that they got a thousand dollars a month raise after my headlines hit the paper. And I wouldn't doubt it because I'm sure the equal employment or one of the government agencies investigated them afterwards with all of the discrepancies if they had the staffing to do it. Um, and I knew at the time that I was working that they had women in jobs that they called management, which they were not, they were just secretaries, but they was supposed to be some big manager but they was not getting the pay but that's who they put on their records okay one individual wanted to know if you had any male allies at goodyear during this time yes i did in fact i had a um, maintenance worker who was in the union he'd already retired but he came to the trial which was not in his county and um the law firm sent him $75 travel expense, and they didn't use him then. After those two women testified, they didn't use him or they didn't use the African-American males. And um, they didn't use either one of them, but he sent his $75 back to the law firm. And the law firm actually has a half a million dollars in my case. That's billable hours and dollars spent. And... Um, when we went to Washington, I, uh, my law firm had, uh, I think it was four or five people from Birmingham, Alabama in Washington to represent me. The other side only had one, but the government lawyer took, over, took, took the Goodyear side. Okay. Um, what advice do you have for girls and young women entering the workplace for the first time? How can they advocate for equal pay and get it for themselves? They must get it right up front because equal pay is generally um, a percentage it raises are 
percentages of whatever that person starts out and they need to get that rightful pay up front and don't listen to people telling them oh in six months we'll 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 raise your pay uh, that had that happened to me twice i've changed if you saw my resume it i changed jobs fast early on because i was told they would change my pay and they did not and uh, so i started looking for a firm but today young people have the computers they have research they have all of this knowledge that's out there in the history that they can check they need to also speak to an individual maybe that works at that firm to see and do the research do the research on how does that company work do they treat their people fair i for women and minorities i love these companies who go out recruiting go out to the high schools and start recruiting young women for science and math and some of those kick off jobs like engineering and and i've met itt up in seneca falls new york they go out to the high schools and recruit salesforce does a lot of that so is this really those are the companies you want to work for how do they treat families if you have a small child is there a kindergarten on the side is there a nursery on the side is there a wellness and there are companies that are my grandson that him and his wife just had that baby um a year ago he she got six weeks maternity to leave after the baby came he got six weeks paid i couldn't believe it in alabama of all places but there's a company here that does that. that is, those are the kind of companies you want to dig into. Okay. I think we have time for one final question. And again, all the thank yous and the comments about how inspiring you've been keep rolling in. But I think this is going to be our last question. What is your best advice for women who want to have the courage to stand up for themselves? Oh, that's a great question. And I usually tell my audience is that and I forgot. Okay, to stand up for yourself, you've got to be tough. Of course, if you're in a job that they're not paying you fairly or treating you fairly already, uh, maybe you're not tough there. I don't know, but you need to be tough. You need to have a family that supports you. And you need a higher power. I've had a faith that the man upstairs has blocked, looked over me all of this way. You know, I've been doing this since 2007, traveling, traveling in the early months. I might make, I might leave home um, the first of the month and not come back till the end of the month. And uh, I'd be gone from airport to airport, but um, I've never missed, never missed a date, never been late. Um, only one time did I have to call and say I can't come, but it was a family situation. And um the rest of the time, I've never missed a time. Some of them have been awfully hard, but I made them and it was my fate. It was my fate. The doors have opened and, and I have been so blessed. And I didn't, never got a dime, never got a dime, never will get a dime. But the journey, I have been able to see some states and countries. I've been to Canada and Barbados and Rome, Italy. So uh, I carried the Washington attorney with me, but uh, my Birmingham attorney couldn't go. And also after the case was heard and the verdict came out, I got billed from Goodyear for $3,165. The Birmingham attorney sent it to the media and the Washington attorney sent it to two law schools. So I never paid it. I couldn't have paid it. There was no way. And yes, I, I had some bad, I had some bad journey times along the way, but I would do it again but you have to have a family that supports you and you've got to be tough. And um, it's, it's, it's hard. It really is. It's, uh, it's really tough. I'll, I'll be the first to tell you if anybody calls and says, I've got a case, I want to call the EOC and file a charge and what would I have to expect? But I always try to get them to call you folks first because I'm not up. Maybe I need to come to your training more so I can stay up to date and uh, know exactly what a person needs to do. I always tell them to call, get an appointment and tell them what their situation is and see. And I've referred a lot of people to my attorney too. And I will to other people in other states if I know them because people need help. 
this is not right because it goes on. And I met so many people out on the campaign trails when I got to travel on some that um, they didn't have any help. They didn't have family. They, their family was all gone. And they one, one elderly lady had lost her husband and they had just signed a contract for an apartment and she couldn't, she didn't even get enough social security to help that. And that's, that's a hardship. My social security didn't increase and no one from Goodyear ever called to apologize. And see Alabama's an at will state. They could have told me to go home at any time if I was that poor performer that they said I was, but I wasn't. And, and it's just a shame that people are done this way. Thank you so much. I believe have another, I'm, I'm fired up now hearing all the things that you <laughs> folks are doing and uh, about the journey, because I do, I get so fired up and it, it's, uh, I want your young people and the, even the people that's already working, check in. It's, it's okay today to change jobs. It's always a lot better than it will used to be. Well, there's a lot of people who've commented that they're fired up as well with you. And I think we're going to have Jamie Williamson come on now. It's not over yet. There's still a few more All things. Right. Well, thank you, Deb. And thank you, Lily. You know, I, I know that we're all glad that you didn't take your bag and just go home, uh, no. that you stayed and fought the good fight. And we really appreciate that. That that says a lot. And I hope that you have. And I'm sure that you have inspired so many people even here today uh, and those who've heard your story. Um, I did get an opportunity to meet you many, many years ago, and I was inspired then as I am today. So thank you for all that you did. You carried the baton. You got us to that space. And uh, I know there's still work to be done, and the EEOC is excited about continuing on and making sure that equal pay is actually happening in our country. So thank you for, for leading the way and making, um, you know, making the statements that you made so early on. Uh, and, and we thank you for that. Um, we are going to be uh, sending you a, a plaque of appreciation. And it states, uh, with our greatest appreciation, we hereby present Lily Ledbetter with this award and recognition for sharing your story at the EEOC Birmingham Outreach Event and for your ongoing commitment and dedication to the fight for equal pay. So we will be sending that out to you. And again, thank you so much for all that you have done, the inspiration, uh, the fact that you've stood up when other people sat down, it means a lot. And, and I know firsthand that it does take, and it is a tough thing to do. So thank you for doing that and having the grit to make sure that other uh, young women that are coming after you don't have to have the same problems uh, that they are faced with. I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Elise Brown uh, for reflections. Elise is the uh, currently the enforcement manager in the Birmingham office uh, where Lily actually filed her charge of discrimination. And I believe Elise had something to do with part of that. It was part of the case. So uh, Elise, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Good afternoon, everyone. As Ms. Ladbetter stated, uh, Ms. Ali Kroon was the assigned investigator who took her charge of discrimination when she came to her office. She and her sister Gladys both worked in the Birmingham District Office, but both have since passed. As an investigator, Ali was thorough and empathetic. All of her charges consisted of at least three to five folders being at least two to three inches thick. When she submitted an RFI, she asked for everything, including the kitchen sink. And as Ms. Ledbetter already stated, um, when Mr. Goldfarb needed some information from the commission, he had everything he needed just because of her. The team members responsible for file disclosure back then, I believe was Kay Lindsay for Section 83s and Tonico for FOIAs, they can attest to those voluminous charge files of Ollie's. And as far as I know, during my tenure with commission, Ollie never received any complaints or requests for reconsideration. She was just that thorough. When Ollie spoke about the Let Better Goodyear charge, she always commented on how egregious and blatant the discrimination that Ms. Ledbetter endured for years. She was, she also expressed how excited she was when Ms. Ledbetter initially prevailed in court and won the $3.8 million. You would have thought Ollie won that money. She was so excited. Then came the Supreme Court decision that overturned the case. 
And because of the Supreme Court decision, we formed a committee in our office to review and scrutinize all charges that allege pay discrimination, Title VII and EPA. The committee consisted of me, the then CRTIU or intake supervisor, Aaronette Holloway, who has since retired, and the then supervisory trial attorney, Julie Bean, who became an AJ, who recently transferred to another agency. And we continue to review those charges until President Obama signed the Little Let Better Fair Pay Act in 2009. We also created a short film about the Let Better versus Goodyear charge that was shown during new investigator training. Currently, I am not sure what happened to the film, but I believe it is in the agency's archives. Um, I believe as a whole, the employees at the Birmingham District Office felt it was an honor and a privilege to be part of this experience in furthering the mission of the commission to prevent and eradicate unlawful employment discrimination. Thank you for allowing me to share. And I will be followed by Edmund Sims, Acting District Director, Memphis, for closing remarks. All right, thank you, Alas. And um, good afternoon. I am Edmund Sims, the Acting District Director of the EEOC's Memphis District Office. On behalf of our chair, Chair Burroughs, and our entire EEOC family, we thank you for participating in today's Eagle Pay Day event. To Ms. Ledbetter, thank you for sharing your courageous story and your fight for justice. Your story has been and continues to be an inspiration for others seeking equal pay within the workforce. Today's event supported over 1,500 attendees on this virtual platform. Thank you for attending today's event and keeping equal pay disparity in the workforce at the forefront of our fight for workplace equality. I would be remiss if I didn't thank all the people behind the scenes that made this possible. From our outreach and education coordinators, Deborah Finney, Terry Peters, Tanya Lennox, Marcel Baldwin, and our outstanding OIT team, thank you. As we leave this event today, let Ms. Ledbetter's story re-energize our commitment to fight for pay equality as we return to our own individual workplaces. Again, thanks for attending today's event. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you.